Good. Yeah. Um, congratulations are in order. They are. Yeah. Thanks, mate. It's um. Oh, it's just the best thing ever, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Wow. It, it's impossible to explain it fully, or I mean, words don't do it justice for those who don't have kids. You know. Not at all. Yeah, it's just the most special feeling. Ayana, mums are just incredible. The bond that they have with the baby and witnessing it all is just like the most beautiful thing in the world. It's um, just so special, yeah. How did the pregnancy or how did the uh, labor go? Oh, yeah, it was like, so now she was born here pretty much right where I'm sitting outside under the full moon. Um, it was such a magical night. Yeah, it, we couldn't have hoped or wished or dreamed for, you know, a, a beautiful entry, more beautiful entry into the world for her. It was just, yeah, incredible, like so beautiful and special and just under candlelight and the full moon. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, how long did the labor last? So, I mean, it depends where you, where you kind of start it from, but, you know, Ayana kind of started getting little contractions the morning of early hours of the morning of um and i was born at 11 p.m that night but it didn't really like we were swimming and sort of walking around everything through the day then at about seven o'clock at night it kind of started intensifying and then yeah it was kind of all on but um yeah i kind of just sort of transcended into this other deeper world within herself and just yeah it was it was incredible to witness it was so beautiful remarkable um how's she how's she doing in recovery great every day she's so nice two two and a half weeks old now so um you know there's definitely we haven't sort of ventured too far from the nest um each day ayana's feeling better and better um you know her body is recovering amazingly and she's feeling you know feeling great and talking about surfing um any day now which is pretty pretty incredible yeah yeah we had to kind of hold her back a little bit but she's um yeah we're really fortunate we can walk to the beach it's a couple of kilometers from here so in the last week we've been walking down there um and yeah she's just feeling stronger and better by the day wow yeah, yeah. i mean a whole new appreciation for the human body right totally it's the transformation that the, the female body goes through. And oh, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Like what, what humans and women are capable of. It's just, yeah, when you start learning about, you know, the bond and the reason why you create these bonds with the baby and, you know, breastfeeding is just like, oh, yeah. It's just incredible. Yeah, it really is. So she was born on a proper full moon exactly yeah hey uh, my kettle just started whistling yeah it's going go nuts. grab it oh you want to yeah babe. back okay cool um yeah full moon like yeah full 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 moon um just yeah there's got to be some some extra energy out there you know I know I don't know what it means, but it means something. It means something. Yeah, there's something going on, something in the air <laughs> for sure. What, how far off of our due date was that? We had, um, so we kind of had two due dates. Uh, we had like, because we were having a, a home pregnant, like a natural birth, a home pregnancy, um, a home birth, they pushed it back a week just to kind of give us a bit more of a buffer. So it was two days off the second, the pushback pregnancy, uh, pushback birthday, but a week after um, the initial. But yeah, I mean, you know what it's like. They sort of say it's more of a birth month than anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And just a side note, how's your mom doing? Mom's doing, yeah, pretty good. Dude, yeah. has she got, gotten to spend time with Naya and everything? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, little, yeah. A few little visits. We've kind of been, um, I guess, you know, just having a bit of space, uh, like just to kind of soak it all in and adjust in these really early stages. But 
Mum's been great, really helpful. Um, Ayana's parents were here for a couple of weeks and they were nice. staying a couple of kilometres away, which was amazing. They were just so helpful for the both of us. Um, so nice to have that support for Ayana. And, yeah, I mean, we, the three of us, we're just sort of glued to each other and just in we've just been in this absolute love bubble and um and yeah every, you know family and, and a few friends have just been making our lives so much easier and yeah it's been really really special time of our lives yeah that's a good detail by the way like i guess if somebody asked me for advice i wouldn't have thought to tell them that but you bring it up which is keep people at a certain distance the help is helpful, like people dropping off meals and being supportive, but they can overdo it. And I, we had some family over shortly after we um, had our kid. And I remember Lauren feeling obligated to play the role of host. And so she kind of overdid it and then regretted it immediately after and for days after. And so people don't always take that cue, you know, the guests don't always take that cue. So it's probably smart to create a little bit of a bubble totally yeah yeah it's i mean i never until i before i was a parent i didn't see it i you know if a friend or family had a baby it, i was like oh, i just want to meet you know meet the baby yeah. and congratulate you and see but now being on the other side of it um yeah i think so important to just you know have a you know respectful distance and you know things like food are just so helpful and yeah, if you can bring something to the family, like um, to make, you know, to help with them, it, it does, it helps, helped us a lot. And yeah, it's, yeah, they're just so precious and tiny. And obviously mum has gone through like a huge, huge transformation and, and um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really wild, amazing point of your life. Hey? <laughs> yeah, you can't overstate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no words for it. Well, we're going to cover obviously the exact same ground that we covered in our last conversation. So it's kind of awkward to be asking you the, the exact same questions, but pretend like you haven't heard them before. No, you like, I don't know. I guess I think with everything um, going on with, you know, the lead up to this film, you know, those late, late stages of the pregnancy um yeah I just had my mind and I was just in a bit of a different world and you know I honestly can't even remember our conversation which is ridiculous yeah, yeah I was just sort of like so you know absorbed by um you know trying to be present here but also you know it's just a you know it's a you know what it's like yeah I just sort of felt like oh you know, it'd be nice to have that conversation again now that I've, you know, everything, everyone's safe and happy and, and I'm in this kind of like, I wouldn't say better headspace or anything, but much clearer mind, um, you know, for totally. sure. Yeah, <laughs> I totally understand. Well, I'll start by just saying um, I was impressed with your Indonesian by watching the <laughs> film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've grown up spending a lot of time in Indonesia, uh, so I had a little, a little head start. I, it's not like I picked it all up on the boat, but um, yeah, my my grandmother's been going to Indonesia for sixty years or so. Uh, my mum's been going for the last sort of thirty to forty years, and and they would both take turns of dragging me along every time they went since I was born. So, um, it, you know, I feel like I should should know more and be more fluent, but. Um, you know, it's something that I'm passionate about and, and connecting with the people over there and, and um, learning the language is the least I can do, um, you know, to be able yeah. to communicate and connect with those people and, and that, you know, that country and that part of the world. So, yeah, I mean, Indonesia is massive as well. And there are so many different dialects. Um, you know, I only know, you know, the very basic Bahasa Indonesian and I don't know a lot of it. You know, I can speak um i can have conversation i can you know get ask you know learn a little bit about people you know get what i want um or need you know whilst when we're shopping or you know communicating with people simple simple sort of conversation but 
um, you know, there's certain certainly parts of the world over there, parts of the country that they, that we definitely can't understand each other. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just being able to communicate with the fishermen and and village people and you know stuff is yeah, kind of. I feel like um, yeah, I felt like it's just the least I could do, you know. And, yeah, I'm and sure. it's nice to have that, you know, to learn more about people too, and connect with people on a different level. Yeah. What was your the reason for your grandma going sixty years ago? She so she was going okay, sixty years. So that's, that was in, so she was going in the seventies. What about fifty years? Sorry, I had to be okay. carried away. But, um, yeah, she has always been in like the secondhand clothing trade which she's and and jewelry so she's um so she's silver there's a big i mean i guess a small silver industry and uh jewelry industry in little island um a little town in bali called chaluk where she would spend a lot of time buying silver jewelry for a, a little shop that she had back here um and yeah she had she i wouldn't say a adopted but she from those early days of traveling to indonesia she connected with a few family and helped them with um schooling education helping build a a, a hotel over there providing their family jobs in the hotel she kind of and she she would stay there throughout you know her time um and yeah she calls you know there's a few people over there she calls her sons <laughs> and and daughters and stuff like that and they've always i mean if you You've, I'm sure you've been to Indonesia, but if you if you if you've been there, you know just the nature, the beautiful nature of the Indonesian people, and how warm and welcoming, and how connected to their family they are, um, and what beautiful relationships they have. And you know, once it's a place that you go to, that um, people just make you feel so welcome, and and it's impossible not to um, develop a strong you know friendships, you know, with these people. So yeah, I think she just was really drawn in by the nature of the people there and um, spent most of her time in Bali itself. And the culture there is, yeah, I mean, just beautiful people. And yeah. Yeah. Is, so she, then, and then, yeah. is she still around your grandma? She is. Yeah. Um, touch wood. She, she's in hospital at the moment. She had a bit of a close call last week. Um, she had a stroke, which was, not the first one she's had, but I mean, she's just such a strong woman. She's so inspiring. She's, I mean, she's 92. She still lives at home. She still drives a little stick shift manual car. Um, yeah, she's, she's such an inspiration for me and her and I are really close. Um, I mean, I would just, I would just imagine considering her history that she would have a deep appreciation for the film. Yeah. Yeah. She's, um, yes yeah, she's she's great yeah she's has she no, has she seen it yet not yet no okay. no i was hoping that she was going to be able to come to the screening um this friday night but she's just not quite up to it yet gotcha. but yeah yeah her body's just starting to let her down which you know I, I guess is pretty realistic at that that age um but you know her her hearing is, is starting to go and really frustrating her and and unfortunately this stroke that she just had last week she's she's lost her ability to talk oh, right now. so um you know what she has to go through some rehab and therapy but she's also just wants to you know live out her days and not be in hospital and and all that sort of stuff she's just yeah yeah she's a she's a battler <laughs> and she's yeah. incredibly stubborn um but she's yeah she's so strong and yeah she's amazing all right well get this film in front of her even if yeah, she can't yeah. make it to the screening yeah for sure for sure yeah um, yeah she, she's come <laughs> come to all the other screenings and yeah that's it's, great it's yeah well can you give the listeners a kind of rundown of the concept for the film and how did it develop yeah, so I mean, as I guess majority of the people know that have followed our films and stuff, we've been supported by Need Essentials for since sort of day one, you know, a long time now. And any, you know, these films kind of 
they kind of have all just start from a little dream or an idea um, and needs backed us 100% of the way and help bring these films to life. And when I first um, kind of first came around, I mean, I was starting to get have this curiosity around sailing. I didn't grow up as a sailor or on boats at all. Um, but I was starting to get this kind of desire to learn, you know, to try, kind of travel further, you know, and more live more self-sufficiently and, and thought, wow, I'd just love to learn to sail, you know. And and that came around um, at this really amazing time when I, when I met Ayana. It was just, I met Ayana in the surf and I learned, you know, in, in one of our first conversations, I don't know how I got it out of her, but she, she told me that she'd grown up on a boat with her family, traveling the West Coast of California and America down to Central America. And I just thought that was the most amazing coolest childhood and and damn she's got like sailing in her blood you know like far out and that just ignited this like dream of mine um and we really connected over it and we were like we gotta work towards getting ourselves a boat or you know at least learning to sail first you know and we kind of just like got talking and got kind of carried away with the idea and and um and ryan who founder of need who's a mate of ours he's got a you know a lifetime of sailing experience as well and and as soon as we kind of um sparked our interest you know like our thoughts and ideas around learning to sail he at the time had a little 25 foot full killed mono hull uh down in the yamba river really beautiful capable little pocket cruiser it's been around the world before um and he was like well this is you know this is the perfect boat to learn on at the very least. And Ryan really took us under his wing and, you know, we were just in the, in the, in the river, um, in the Clarence river, an hour and a half from home. And yeah, it wasn't until we really, I stepped on the boat, I really realized how little I knew, you know, like feel like growing up around the ocean, you know? Yeah. But man, it's like a total different language. You're learning so many, just everything you look at. Like Ryan would be like, grab the main sheet. And I'm like, what's that? Or like, you know, it's just, it was, um, yeah, we were really starting from scratch. And Ryan really, you know, was a um, was so helpful for us, you know, like just getting familiar with it and just kind of keeping and sparking, fueling that dream. He was like, you've got it. You can do it, you know, like, yeah teaching me what you know what to look for and what to not to look for in a boat and then um yeah it all kind of really escalated quickly and at the time my my dad was selling his um 35 foot monohull up in the gulf of thailand um he'd had it on the market for a few years through covid and um he basically wasn't sure if he wanted to sell it or not sell it and I kind of had recently sort of connected with him. He wasn't there a lot through my childhood and, and we don't have a lot of, um, I guess, shared interest and, and sailing had become, quickly became one of them. So when we kind of learned he had the boat and he learned that I was, you know, interested, we kind of, yeah, made this bond. And, and he said, hey, look, like there's no pressure for you to buy the boat off me, but um, I've had a dream. He, he said this, I've had a dream to sail around Indonesia, but, you know, my shoulder's starting to get sore. I'm starting to, you know, kind of, you know, get a bit older. I, you know, how about you take the boat, you know, if you want it, buy it off me. If you don't get it to Indonesia, um, you know, and I'll, I'll sail it around there. That's, you know, it's a win-win. It was, you know, a long way from where it was. Um, and, yeah, we were just, so that kind of just was like, whoa, this is too good to be true. You know what I mean? Like, it was like far out like how's the, the timing of this and I mean despite us only having a couple of months experience and never lived or really sailed a boat um you know I, it was very ambitious and, and a little bit naive um but yeah I think it was the best way to go for us like I just didn't want to I don't know I think just jumping in the deep end with it was you know it was a steep learning curve but it was the way to go for sure and and then obviously yeah, we thought, I mean, it's an opportunity to make a film and um, live out a little dream of ours. So, yeah, that's how it all kind of uh, started. So what was the total distance for the original concept of Thailand to Indonesia? 
Well, naturally, I mean, being a surfer, I wanted to take the long way. You can't, you're not going to bypass all the, you know, West Sumatra and all the islands and wave rich little zones out there. Um, you could have done it as the bird flies pretty much um, in a couple of weeks, really. I think it's about 1500 miles or so. Um, yeah, but we, I mean, we took, it took us over 5,000 miles and <laughs> 12 months. Um, gotcha. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, in those early, those first couple of weeks, we had um, a friend of my old man's, uh, George, his name is, and he's a diesel mechanic, a, you know, a sailor. He's built his own own boat, um, lived and travelled throughout Southeast Asia for the last 20 years. And, um, yeah, we, you know, we were really lucky to recruit George to join us for those first few weeks and, you know, Calypti, the boat, hadn't been used for a couple of years, um, although the, she'd been, you know, upkept pretty well. Um, I mean, boats need to be used, so there were, you know, naturally things that um, broke and needed to be ironed out. Um, so that, you know, that first, we had about 1,200 miles with George. Um, and, yeah, that was, yeah, such a crucial part of our journey. We, we learned a lot from George. We learned a lot, a lot about the boat, what it was capable of, um, what we should be looking out for. And yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, it should be stated too that you did take some sailing classes before leaving too, right? Yeah, I signed up, like when I started, you know, getting kind of serious about the idea, I signed up to a coxswain's course at the local TAFE here, which is like equivalent of, you know, like a city college. Um, and yeah, that, this coxswain course was great in theory. Um, it covered everything from basic engine maintenance to first aid, um, seamanship, navigation, um, how to deploy a life raft. You know, it was really cool. And I, I, um, the timing of it and it just didn't quite fit in with our, like, I don't know, I ended up going and getting a few really good things i learned how to deploy a life raft which was great um, i learned how to identify a fire which was great i learned how to tie a bowline <laughs> like just these really simple things but i made a couple of friendships in that class of you know one of the teachers in particular angus um yeah i found you know i was able to take you know workbooks and stuff but i didn't complete the course i, I probably went to about four or five lessons out of a you know i think it's a it's pretty intense course i think you can do it over maybe three or four months but it's a year-long course um and there's a lot i'm still considering actually redoing the course because um i feel like there's a lot to learn and a lot i a lot i learned on the trip um but a lot more to learn to sort of gain my confidence and, and knowledge around that but yeah that was um yeah i mean it was good it, it was a great introduction for me but i i, I didn't see it out which yeah. yeah i mean it seems like the sort of thing that the more you invest in, the more you get out of, and you can never be too prepared on the ocean, probably, you know, like you're always going to encounter scenarios that are going to challenge your uh, knowledge set and your skill set. So the more, the better, probably. Totally. Yeah. And that was the biggest thing <clears throat> that I found that we found that was that lack of experience. So, um, you know, our scale we didn't have a scale. We had no reference of what was normal and what wasn't normal, what was should be scary or what shouldn't be scary. And um, so it was over the, you know, over the course of the trip, that scale, you know, changed. And, you know, like by the end of it, I remember, I still remember so clearly the first squall that we got in, um, just in the Gulf of Thailand in between the bottom of Cambodia and the Malaysian coast. And um, at the time, Ayana and I were freaking like we were like this, this you know it was it was I mean it was an electrical storm so there was lightning around and quite strong wind but it lasted maybe 30 minutes um and it was a you know you're in a gulf there there wasn't a log of big open swell there were not a whole lot of not a whole lot of hazards like it wasn't couldn't have been that consequential and it, it really wasn't that severe like but at the time I just remember going this is psycho like is the boat going to handle it? Are we going to be all right? Like, and it was so mellow, really. Um, and then, you know, by the end of it, fast forward, 
11 months or whatever, yeah, you, you, you've gained a lot more confidence in the boat, you know, what it's capable of, you know, what you're capable of. Um, yeah, there's just so many, so many, you know, so much more to it. Well, and, yeah, just to give listeners kind of an idea for those who don't sail, I mean, they can envision being in a perilous scenario like that, but the considerations go well beyond that from needing to know how to read charts, you know, uh, basic medical aid, of course, what to do if somebody goes overboard, there's protocols for that, how to repair sails, basic engine and mechanical repairs, um, boat repairs, there's all sorts of stuff that you need to know. So it gets complicated, but can you explain the first major problem that you guys encountered? I know there's one that's documented in the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you're saying, there are just so many different scenarios that could happen. Um, sailing, the, the basic handling of lines and raising and trimming sails is just the very minimal. It was all those other things, you know, the repairing right. and the mechanical side that really overwhelmed me. Um, yeah, the first thing happened, first sort of, I guess, major thing that happened was um, we were off the coast of Malaysia about a week or so little more into our trip um, and we'd been doing quite a lot of motoring um, because of the time of year and, and lack of wind and um, we were basically motoring along and the engine temperature you know rose to 100 the alarm went off the engine had overheated so we killed the engine George and I George you know like he's been a mechanic he, he straight down basically checked checked over the engine trying to find um, what had happened we couldn't diagnose it on the spot and then we could see you know off, off the horizon was a bit of a squall and we basically you know thought it it made more, most sense just to get to a protected anchorage which was only a few miles away um and you know diagnose the problem so we we ended up towing calypti into that little anchorage um and yeah we spent a few hours we changed the impellers we're looking at all you know the exhaust intake you know in in inside the hull with you know this was great for me because george was really teaching me where to look and what to look for um and then we just yeah didn't know couldn't find the problem and and iana was swimming overboard um at the time and we threw a pair of goggles to have a look at the intake for the exhaust um basically with most inboard diesel engines they're water cooled so uh seawater comes in through the intake goes through cools the engine and comes out the exhaust and what had happened um which makes total sense and i'm surprised it wouldn't and didn't happen a lot more on the trip but a, a, a little plastic chip packet had been stuck on the intake so the engine naturally wasn't getting the water it needed to cool itself and yeah essentially the engine overheated um so that was the first chapter of that first drama but we got to it and we thought that's a win spent the night there there was this classic scenario Iana went off in the dinghy found this perfect little left-hand point break like waist high it was just a mirage almost that we couldn't believe our luck you know like we had absolutely no expectation to be surfing for at least another month or two um and here we were just surfing this little point break by ourselves and we thought yeah and everything happens for a reason we were just over the moon um and then so the following day we, we left that island back on on route um and we only got a couple of miles away from the island and the the engine overheated again and we're like what's going on you know i oh, know the engine cut out and we're like what's going on and <clears throat> so we're like oh we'll sail back you know, tack, we won't run the engine, we'll just tack back in. Um, and we're going against the current. We're there for a couple of hours, just trying to make up a mile or two. And then we're like, oh, we'll just, you know, the engine's cooled a little bit now. We'll we'll put the engine on and motor just that mile in. And, and as we did that, and George was at the helm, um, and I was in the cabin and I opened up the floor and just to have a look, bit of a routine um, check of just the engine. And... I noticed that the bilge is filling up with water, like batteries were ne nearly completely swamped. And I was like, 
oh shit my like heart like dropped i'm like we're sinking oh my god what's happening what what do we do oh shit like george george there's a lot of water in here what's going on um and george being like the calm nature and seasoned sailor that he is he was he's like it's all good it's all right let's turn the engine off let's just you know just relax and um so we ended up turning the engine off and we did we tacked back in the water stayed subsided we were managed to like you know drain the water out with the aft bilge in the compartment that the water was coming in so we get back in there and we're like what's going on now and um basically from that first little scenario where the engine overheated um, it had caused one of the old hose clamps that hadn't been changed for years because it was in a really awkward little compartment under the cockpit um, it had basically rusted and busted off the exhaust hose from aft of the engine so all this water was that was supposed to be going out the stern of the boat was going into the bottom into the bilge of the boat so it was essentially <clears throat> sinking itself like at a rapid rate um and you know it was that sort of moment and that that kind of scenario that for me put a lot of things in perspective and and in a, in a good way um yeah just having that experience you know like most of the time it's something really small um and there are solutions to the the problem um which could be a much bigger problem if you don't get to them um but it's norm all, almost always just takes that time to diagnose it kind of stay calm diagnose the problem um it's just like when you're in a bit of a precarious or dangerous situation you know like if you're Later on in the trip, we had times where, you know, either ran out of fuel or the engine fuel hoses busted off and stuff. And, you you know, between reefs and islands and waves are crashing in there and you've really got to act fast um, and it can be really consequential. So, yeah, I think being vigilant and just sort of being aware that 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 ex that kind of specific time just caught, taught me to really be prepared and look forward um, and prevent do everything I can to prevent these little things happening. So, you know, after that, I went through over all the hose clamps, replaced, you know, all the hose clamps that I could find, you know, fuel lines, just making sure there weren't small leaks, oil leaks, you know, just kind of staying on top of the maintenance, checking over rigging and sails and just sort of like planning ahead rather than freaking out in the moment. Do you think that you would have been able to solve those problems if George wasn't on board? oh that early in the trip like i and i i was so green we were both so green to it all you know like i didn't to be honest i didn't really understand how an inboard diesel engine worked even like um i knew the very basics ryan had kind of given me a little crash course on them um yeah i mean i knew that the time that we hadn't hit anything structurally like there was no reason for water to be coming in. It's not like the hull was compromised or anything like that. Um, but in the moment, you know, like, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say, like we definitely wouldn't, wouldn't have sunk, but it could have, you know, the batteries could have got wet. They would have swole. We would have lost all the electronics. It could have been a nightmare. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I don't think it was life threatening, but it was definitely, yeah, it could have, it would have been worse and it would have taken us a lot longer to work out what had happened. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's scary. Um, but, <laughs> but like, but like you said, a great lesson because it is a pretty simple, um, you know, the, the engine is pretty simple. The details are pretty simple. If you just have the knowledge for how to run through the protocols, assess everything you'll come to the problem. You know, it won't be outside of your, it won't be something too crazy. Um, you just have to know how everything operates basically. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's it. You know, um, diesel engines are designed to be quite simple. You know, there's yeah. kind of a few components to them. It's, it's fuel, you know, air and electricity <laughs> based and power, you know? So um, yeah, once you can kind of, determine you know what where the problem is where it's coming from it is i mean there's a lot of moving parts other moving parts in a boat to it um it does 
when you think about it whole, and that's what I was doing in the early part, I was thinking about everything and felt like I just have to, had to learn absolutely everything about every boat. Um, it wasn't until we kind of got on to Calypti and I thought, I realized, well, we don't need to know everything about every dirt boat. We just need to learn this boat. And this is everything that matters to us right now. So, um, yeah, having people like George and Ryan and Kelly, um, Kelly who joined us a little later in the trip, an experienced sailor as well, really helped us, you know, yeah. develop a deep, deeper understanding of our boat. Um, so how was the trip structured? Obviously, it became a film, so there's cameras on board. How was the film uh, structured in terms of who would be coming and going off the boat and who would be operating in what role? Yeah, so because, I mean, because of the nature of the trip, um, we, you know, it, basically we had, you know, the concept of making a film from the journey. Um, and Ishka, you know, was the main filmer and obviously the editor of the film. Um, so he was, I guess, the director. Um, and Ishka, you know, could only join us for periodically, you know, shorter stints, three to four weeks. I think in total he maybe spent six to eight weeks out of the year. Um, another filmer that we had was Kelly Foote, and Kelly's a sailor himself, and he kind of he reached out to Ayana and I um, early stages of the trip just saying, hey, stoked on the trip you guys are doing love to get involved you know i've got this experience you know can i help out in any way um and he was a really great asset to us he, we learned a lot from kelly he was there for um this was after george left immediately after george left kelly came um Ke kelly knows his way around a camera and a boat um and it was a really nice transition going from george who was totally in control to Kelly who had my had our back um, and you know he kind of took a little bit more of a role of documenting it um, whilst being there for support for Ayana and I let us make the calls and we could just bounce off him um, so Kelly was with us for a month a um, few weeks either side of reaching waves so a couple of weeks before a couple of weeks while we reached waves and then um, then Ishka came with Ryan once we'd reach waves they came for two weeks uh, obviously Ishka took over the filming role and then and Ryan helped Ayana and I as he did experience sailing to surf which was great um, and then it was this kind of I mean we'd been on Calypti for a couple of months but um, basically Ishka and Ryan left at the same time and all of a sudden it's just Ayana and I in the Indian Ocean out there just fending for ourselves, totally responsible for everything, you know, on board. Every decision we made, we had to, you know, answer to. Um, it was, we were ready for it uh, mentally and physically. We were really looking forward to that, having that space just together and with ourselves. But um, it was definitely like a, a, oh shit moment, like a, oh yep, but now we're really doing it. It's just us, like, sort of thing um so yeah I mean, and you know throughout the whole journey we had months and months that would go undocumented um you know like i had a little camera on board that would film little bits and pieces but there were yeah tons of surfs and and you know scary and, and amazing beautiful moments that did not get documented um there was yeah when once we got a little bit further down down south another yeah, maybe a couple of months um, when we got down around the, I won't even say where, but we had a, another couple of filmers sort of join us periodically or linked up, you know, for a couple of surfs when there'd be a swell. Um, Inigo Grasset, he's a, a Spanish fella, really nice and talented um, videographer. There's some beautiful footage of his in the film um, of some underwater footage. It's it's one of my favourite sections of the film. It's just it's just magical. Um, and then another an Indonesian and for came on the boat for a couple of weeks and we were at anchor in a little bay and we surfed a little a few little waves around there. So that was strictly sort of some surf footage again. And then Milo Inglis, 
Um, yeah. Milo's originally from New Zealand. Really, really nice guy. Um, I'd met Milo once really briefly in Byron when I, um, before the trip. And Milo, I'd, I'd admired some of Milo's filming work uh, beforehand. So I knew that he was, he knew what he was doing behind the camera. And um, I asked Milo, I'm like, hey, mate, have you got any sailing experience? Have you, have you been spending any time around boats? You know, and he, he's like, oh, yeah, 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 I've got a yeah, little bit of experience. So I think he said he's, he had his, um, he had maybe just a, a crew, a ticket, a crew ticket or something, you know, like he'd, he'd done a course. And I was like, oh, that's great. Like, that's more experience than I've got. Sweet, you know. So, um, yeah, we we um, we had Milo on board for about four or five weeks on the boat at one stage, and um, Milo was just yeah, he got some absolutely beautiful footage. Um, it was a real real pleasure to travel with, um, yeah, and just good company. But he hadn't had a a lot of experience on boats, and I think he thought also that we knew what we were doing. <laughs> um, so we get there, and I'm like. Milo, that's great. You're here. Like, can you help me with this? And he's and he was like, uh, like, I don't know what that is. I'm like, fuck, I don't know what that is. Like, and we just had this, and it was kind of this moment where I was like, oh shit. Like, you know, I was like, kind of hoping for someone else to lean on right now. It's like, you know, some moments get pretty stressful. Um, yeah. But it was it was great. It, it made me grow through it. Um, and it was great to again have someone else there that we can even just bouncing questions and when you're unsure of something, you know. It um, yeah. just helps to have someone to kind of, you know, throw the pros and cons up and, you know, brainstorm and, and whatnot. But, um, but yeah, that was pretty much, that was it. Um, Ishka, Ishka came a couple of times throughout the film. Milo came for those four weeks, Kelly for four weeks. Yeah, there was probably four months out of the 12 months were documented. Wow. Uh, and then the rest, yeah, there's some, some imagery and stuff throughout the film that Ayana and I took. Um, but yeah, it was it, like, I really, really embraced and enjoyed that time not filming. It was beautiful for Ayana and I, we had this, you know, like we were just alone out there and no cameras really, you know, just, you know, it felt just epic to be having these surfs just together and just sort of, yeah, soaking it all in and not feeling like any pressure. Um, to film, not that really do um, the way that we travel, but um, it kind of became a little bit of a hurdle in the second, like in the editing, like the post-production stage when um, Iona and I had finished this epic journey of ours that, you know, we'd grown and changed as people, I felt, um, and I wanted to basically try and tell the story with the film with that had limited footage to show you know, mm -hmm. like of, of these, you know, events and things that happen and, you know, you, you do, you, you change as a person, you have these really profound experiences that, you know, if you try to say or tell someone and it kind of like doesn't translate, you know, and um, as, you know, as for the person that had that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of made it a little bit challenging um, in the, you know, in the making of the film um in the editing of the film but yeah the footage from milo kelly carlo um you know everyone they got those 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 extra few sessions and captured those extra moments that ayana and i couldn't get was yeah really amazing really helped helped us all to create the film that we did yeah i suppose also, just go ahead i was just going to also add yeah with you know like having ryan to bounce it off and help with the storytelling and stuff like that was yeah, and it is when it comes back. It is we are all a little team, you know, and um, yeah. Well, I was just thinking, hearing you say some of that, that uh, there's almost no amount of footage that you could have gathered that would really accurately represent the change that you went through and the what it means to you personally, you know, because it is just it's impossible to put into words or visuals, probably. Totally, yeah, and it's all these like just little moments you know that you have and you know it may be um a local fisherman just coming up and a, a small interaction with them or you know buying squid and fish off them for weeks at a time or you know you'd be in the middle of a crossing and laying there on the deck just staring at the stars um in the middle of the ocean feeling like the only person on earth 
and you know and then you know simple daily tasks and things where you you know getting fruit and veggie and water and fuel and stuff like that and interacting with you know village people and yeah i mean it's just yeah it's a, it's it's a beautiful way of life um living on the boat and it's also i mean it's quite can be quite confronting as well like you're very much that the boat is i guess a metaphor for you know it's it's essentially your world you know why you're there and everything in and on that boat um is what matters the most to you and you're so responsible for everything um from you know the waste that you make um you know and where it goes and you know the food that you eat the drink the you know the water that you drink um you know the energy the power that you consume from your solar there's just um you know there's so yeah you're just so connected in that little world and it, it's it's you know it's an amazing experience and it's something that's hard to kind of explain to someone else without having had that yourself yeah what what was the most unexpected psychological challenge about you know being alone or at sea for an extended period of time being alone and at sea was our favorite times mm. um that was far yeah that was where we felt the most at home i think um yeah the crossings the passages the, the days and weeks where we'd just be in the middle of the ocean that was the best some of the best times of our trip for sure um wow. yeah i think I mean, living on a, a small boat with people can have its challenges, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, there were certainly highs and lows of the journey, but it was all kind of, you know, we, you just have to embrace them. Um, yeah. There's no escape from it, you know, like it, it's all a state of mind as well. Um, so, yeah, you just have to, you know, kind of look at it you know, in a positive way. And, and there's always something to take from, from it. Yeah. Um, other than that little left point, when the chip bag got stuck, uh, what was, how long was it from when you set sail until you hit the first kind of proper surf session? Yeah, that was um, about six weeks. Okay. Yeah, a little bit more. Um, yeah, that means me started in two, just over two months yeah it was we started at the very start of march and it was just after so i remember we had our birthday my honor and i shared birthday a couple of days apart and that was just as we checked into indonesia and it was about a week after that so yeah just over two months seven or eight weeks eight eight or nine weeks i think it was yeah um, um the first spot that you scored almost seemed scripted because it seemed too good to be real yeah, was that uh, was that the actual first spot that you guys stumbled upon yeah yeah we came around the, the, the we came around like the, this island like it took us four days from when we checked out to get to this this little chain of islands and we um we hadn't had a forecast we were just sort of rolling with the weather uh, we didn't yeah we had all this time ahead of us so there was no rush but we were obviously eager and frothing to get to waves um but you know like as we'd be moving you can't really plan to you know plan when you're going to get somewhere um but we just semi kind of coincidentally just came around at first light around the top of this island totally uninhabited um perfect knew there was a, a wave there um but yeah perfect right hand point glassy as three four foot totally like gobsmacked freaking out didn't know you know didn't know what to do couldn't believe it that whole yeah. the build up you know to that moment um yeah we were, it was it was surreal it felt like a mirage yeah i mean you couldn't have timed it better i mean it was just ideal scenario <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, really well. How many how many boards did you bring on the trip? I think I had two board bags. Um, between Ayana and I, about six or seven boards um, at any one time. I think about one one of those was 
hers and we had a couple of shared ones and then the rest was mine. I was a bit selfish. Um, but yeah, we, you know, when friends or ish or someone would come over, they'd, you know, bring or take a board. Um, so, you know, throughout the, the, the boat trip, um, we were, you know, working on developing a few different models of boards, um, which was a really fun and exciting part of it. So yeah, as the, as the trip progressed, we kind of swapped out our boards. I think I, I only broke one board in the trip and it was one that I lent to a friend that I met over there. Um, okay. it was sort of Murphy's law. Um, but yeah, it was more just, um, we were, yeah, just sort of switching out boards, getting, you know, writing something new, working on that Calypti model, um, board that we've, we'd sort of developed in our time over there. But yeah, tell I ended me, up really just tell, writing. Tell me about that Calypti model, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. So that so that little board, um, it's it essentially started as basically the middle two thirds of what was and has been my favorite board, which is like a six eight Fiji, um, a really versatile all round board, right up from one to ten foot. Um, but I, you know, over the years spending time in Indonesia, I know. I knew that I really liked riding a shorter board, um, but I'd always found it kind of, well, have been found finding it a little more difficult jumping from a, a sort of mid-length board down to a shorter board. Um, you know, the transition of that, you know, feeling, making those smaller boards feel a little bit more foreign. Um, so the concept of this board, and it's nothing new, um, you know, people have been doing it, but basically we want to keep that nice, familiar outline and straighter rails of the longer boards that I was really liking. And then, you know, chopping the nose and tail off, um, basically having a, a shorter board that fit tighter in the, you know, in the pocket of the wave and in the, you know, in those waves that we were, we were surfing over there, the reef breaks and hollow barreling waves. So yeah, the first board, it, the first one kind of turned out like a glorified wakeboard looking thing. It's big sort of, chopped off at each end, like not aesthetically too pleasing and not overly refined. Um, but yeah, throughout the, the journey, we basically made, you know, a few major and a few minor little tweaks to it uh, to bring it to where it is now, which is, yeah, we're dubbing it the Calypti model. Um, and it's a double stringer. So reason the double stringer is smaller boards. I've had a little bit of a... Um, it's always a little bit of a challenge when you're riding a twin fin, there's a lot of pressure on either one, either one of the fins and it's not uncommon to bust them out. Um, so our theory behind the double stringer is you're routing the, uh, the fin plug into timber, which is far, far stronger than routing, you know, fitting into foam. Um, I have, haven't busted a single box out since we put them in timber. And it's something we've been doing with obviously, obviously the Fijis for a long time now. Um, and then with some of the single stringed massives and other boards in the past, Simon and I have put just a, a you know, 150 mil little bit of Dow stringer just into the box. And that's worked perfectly. I've ripped off half the board before the fin popped out. Wow. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy how strong it is. And it's, yeah, a little bit more work um, for the board builder, but yeah. So the Clipti, it's twin fin, does it have channel bottom as well? No channel. Um, yep. Twin fin, concave throughout, which is um, different to, you know, majority of the boards are, are v, v bottom, channel bottom. Um, so yeah, definitely a different feeling, more reactive, more. Um, also reactive and also forgiving it's kind of um you know yeah just a fun forgiving lively board really it also looks like it has a bit more nose rocker is that true we've got two versions we've got the a rocker and the boat rocker so the b rocker is more con more um more rocker sorry yeah the b rocker is more rocker and since coming back um lived a year surfing waves in indonesia which have got more you know longer period swell more energy and coming back here i was kind of feeling like i was pushing having to push a little bit harder so we flattened out the rocker um in in one of the models so there's two versions of it um and it is just 
up and go, yeah, yeah, bit gotcha. more foam up the chest. Um, and I much prefer to ride that model around here and in, in more mellow sort of shorter period waves, whereas, you know, a steep pockety barreling wave with more energy and with a little more rocker. Gotcha. So for people watching the film, the Calypti model board that you're riding is the one with the spray on the deck or the color on the deck? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think the only section we used of it is a, um, on the, le the left hander with the, yeah, the back end surfing. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Which, yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about a couple of animal encounters. Uh, what was this? There's snakes on the boat. There's a croc or an alligator at some point tracking the boat. What was the yeah. scariest animal encounter that you guys had? Got to be that crocodile. Um, that was, we, I mean, I obviously knew that the crocodiles inhabited Indonesia, um, but kind of felt like they were a bit of a legend, you know, like, did not imagine to be seeing a crocodile there and and it was really spooky because Ayana and I had, we were anchored in this little island um little island chain in this mangrove area because it was a beautiful safe all-weather anchorage we spent you know maybe six or seven weeks there in total and phosphorescence of a night was just amazing around the boat so we jump off and swim under the moon and things around the boat and couple of fishermen were like oh you know be careful there's you know watch out for crocodile like and we're like really like yeah all right like just sort of didn't take it too seriously and um it wasn't until one night we were sitting out in the cockpit having dinner under a full moon and we're just out there no lights or anything on and there's just i see this silhouette in the distance and this little eye flicker or just a flicker i'm like that looks like it's moving. What is that? And um, anyway, we got the head torch out and basically, yeah, four meter saltwater crocodile was circling our boat. Um, and we just sat there watching it for all night, um, tripping out. I was just like, I can't believe we've been swimming. And scarily, um, I'd even gone home a few weeks before left Ayana. Ayana was on the boat for herself for a few weeks and she was there swimming by herself around the boat and just, I mean, I think this crocodile certainly knew our behavioural patterns and was, yeah, kind of coming in. You know, we were throwing our food and fish scraps and stuff off the boat too and um, yeah, it was wow. kind of a confronting moment when we saw that crocodile and, and thought, you know, a real kind of oh shit moment. This is, you know, that could have been so bad. Uh, and I mean, then that's just the one time you saw him. I mean, he was absolutely around those things uh, have been on the planet far. They've survived far longer on earth than human beings have. You know what I mean? Like, he knows story what he's doing. like they are so well designed to not make a ripple. Like they are just the most prehistoric. Oh, they're yeah, man, they're, they're scary. Crocodiles are really scary. <laughs> we so It was sketchy. actually, it was the following day. Um, we were kind of still shell-shocked from seeing it at the night and thought, you know, that's a once-in-a-lifetime experience, you know, seeing a croc out here. And then the next day, between the anchorage and the wave, which was about three or four miles, we were motoring along, and the crocodile was there, broad daylight, over 30 meters of clear blue water just swimming on the surface towards the little village where they had the fish farms heading into town and no joke like we we were just like stunned to see it that's where the you know the bit of drone footage and stuff that you see in the film um yeah this crocodile broad daylight swimming over crystal clear blue water um we watched it for half an hour it came to swim at the boat, towards the boat, would turn around. It was not intimidated by us at all. It was just, yeah, one of those kind of goosebump moments. And Crazy. Yeah. 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 At some point, somebody finds like a shedded snake skin on the boat. Did you ever find the snake itself? No, we didn't. Um, that was one of many, many snakes that we would have on the boat. Um, that was... 
that was super spooky you know obviously it'd come on and shed its skin and had it gone back in the water or was it in a, a, a cockpit hatch or is it called you know into someone's ready top or something like that um so we were on and i think you should captured it perfectly we were just on such high alert you know I, ryan someone like tickles me on the leg and i squeal and jump and knock the coffee over and um yeah that was yeah that was funny like it wasn't until a couple of months later when it was just diana and i and we were anchored in this little um beautiful little anchorage but we we're next to this island called like not unfairly named snake island because um the amount of sea snakes around there was just oof, crazy like we you know pretty much every day or every night there'd be a sea snake on in our tender um ayana had a one time in particular that she was took herself surfing went to the wave chucked the anchor over looked down there's a like one and a half meter even thicker like a proper venomous you know they, they can kill you the sea snakes um saw that in the in the little tender freaked out jumped out went surfing and then had to get back in the boat in the tender like after a surf snake's still in there and i was sitting on um calypti in the cockpit and she came and i could just see she was just like ah like with this look on her face i was like what's going on and she's like i look and there's just a snake like just behind her hand like on the engine like it was just um and she was just ended up going with it for another surf anyway she was just it was yeah you'd have these wild little interactions with these totally venomous snakes but they're you know the way that it's actually quite difficult for them to bite you although it's not impossible um because their fangs are so far back in their mouth um mm. you know the, the bigger ones certainly can bite you and a lot of fishermen will get bitten when they're cleaning out fishing nets and you know things like that if you to reach back and put your hand on a tiller of the engine and you know spook it um yeah they they, they will bite um so yeah even little things like the fuel cord that goes down you know little things that just trigger us and freak out or you'd be in the middle of the night driving back to the the you know calypti um and well, yeah coming from a village or something and you'd be driving along looking forward with the headlight on or whatever and you'd look back and there'd be a snake on the engine and you'd be like oh fuck, freak out um why, yeah. not dis why not dispatch it and like try to kick it out of the boat i mean you would i'm not like snakes freak me out okay i'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm no snake wrestler um or whisperer um my first instinct like many things on the boat was just to freak out and squeal and then um calm it's all good yeah we just sort of like encourage it to move along or we just get to the boat basically swan dive off the tender onto calypti and just leave the snake and it'd be gone gotcha. by the morning <laughs> gotcha gotcha um yeah. whenever i see adventures like this i always think like man you're probably limiting your you know your diet but it looks like you guys ate better on that boat than I get to eat at home regularly. <laughs> the meals looked incredible. Yeah, yeah. We were eating well. Um, we were eating very clean food, a lot of rice. Heap. I mean, our protein diet was fish, fish and tempeh pretty much, strictly eggs when we could get our hands on eggs. But um, panko fish was a, you know, panko fish tacos cabbage was something we could get a lot of um things like limes and lemons were rare and luxuries um fish wraps and we could get when we could get our hands on wraps frozen wraps we'd buy like hundreds of wraps and put them in the bottom of the fridge and um curries yeah it was a salad pretty much didn't exist what well, wasn't in our diet but fish and veggies and rice was yeah what we what we lived on and popcorn lots of popcorn <laughs> i wouldn't have thought popcorn yeah 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 that was a luxury when we got that's that funny. We <laughs> that's funny yeah. um so yeah, we, go ahead there you go um it seems like throughout the trip there was actually very few times where you looked like you were completely confident in the next passage 
um, <laughs> which kind of gave me anxiety just watching it. It felt like you could never fully relax, but I guess listening to you talk about it, it sounds like, like there was long stretches where you were able to just kind of relax and chill. So did you yeah, ever feel I, like you were in full, fully able to relax? Like, man, yeah, there were times, but no, like I was pretty stressed, like, and anxious, you know, for a good chunk of the trip. I mean, like leading up to a lot of these like passages and planning, you know, going to a new area that wasn't say charted accurately. A lot of our maps were really inaccurate, um, which didn't give me a confidence in going somewhere new. Uh, so once we get to a place and I'd, and I'd tracked it myself and I'd made all these passages in, in good visibility and I, I was confident in the, you know, little reef passes. I knew it Anchorage had good holding. Um, you know, I was, I would become comfortable and less stressed. Um, so that's why we, you know, being fortunate and having time on our side, we basically, you know, like getting to these places was, you know, and, and being able to spend time in one particular sort of place was, was some, you know, kind of the best bits of it. Um, most yeah. enjoyable, like you're saying, but yeah, I mean, passage planning um, was, you just need, I just wanted to be prepared. We had things, you know, on the boat, you know, from auto, uh, oil leaks, um, fuel lines busting, you know, calculating how much fuel we needed in case, you know, we had no wind. Um, you're always sort of planning for food and water um, to have reserves of that. There were times that, you know, we had no auto autopilot for a month or two, which is a luxury. You know, we I met this young couple that had sailed from Perth all the way up, you know, to North Sumatra with no autopilot on a little 35 foot boat, which was just kind of gave me the courage and confidence thinking, well, far out, they've just spent months and months, just the two of them, I can, I'll be right, <laughs> you know, but yeah. uh, something I was so used to, it's like, oh yeah, you know, you can set the autopilot and you can go and adjust the sails or, you know, reef or do whatever you need to do. Um, so it, it definitely made it more of a two man job. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, we were a team and, you know, all these little things like, was just one i mean one big challenge is from the trip that i found we, we were never able to leave calypti there was no dock um no moorings that we ever were able to tie up and take a break from the boat um there was one time where ayana and i left calypti for one week we left calypti at an anchorage in a remote bay um which was We'd spent some time there and I knew the holding was good. I knew it was an all weather protected anchorage, but she was still, Calypti was vulnerable there. You know, there was no one looking after her if something bad had happened, if there was a tsunami, if there was, um, you know, the anchor had dragged from a, a crazy storm. Um, you know, it, it, there was never, what I was trying to say is, yeah, there was never really a moment, even that time we got to leave the boat, you're never not thinking about something on the boat or the boat or something that needed to be your whole world um, so you can't look at those things as burdens um, they what make it so great um, and make it so empowering and, and rewarding too um, yeah having you know having the responsibility was a big one for me and it, it took me quite a while to grasp and and to gain the confidence in myself um, and to not really realize or just to realize that you know like not everything has to be perfect, the boat, not everything has to be working, <laughs> you know, the way it should, you know, there's a few main things on a boat, you know, the engine, um, the sails, um, you know, bilge pumps. Um, yeah. If they're working, you can kind of relax, you know, if your anchor's holding, you know, there's, yeah, it's certainly, um, it took me a while to, kind of be able to decompress even actually especially after getting off the boat yeah. i found that you know six months after getting off the boat i was still decompressing and realizing whoa and i was quite high alert all around the clock like it really <laughs> it really prepared um 
for me, like living on a boat was um, far more intense than parenthood. <laughs> having, a, <laughs> having a baby, like it was great, great training. I mean, we've been so blessed. No, I actually sleeps like a log, but I feel like everyone was saying, man, you better get some sleep. Like you got a baby coming, good luck. And everyone that checks in now is like, hope you're getting some sleep. Like, and we're like, yeah, I mean, nothing compared to living on a boat. <laughs> That's so funny. You never would have thought that that would be the perfect training. Um, yeah. Perfect. Well, what I was going to say is just that uh, I've never heard anyone articulate the sailing experience and the virtues of it as well as you did in the closing dialogue of the film. And it actually made me inspired. Like I want to do a similar trip just based on the way that you communicated it yeah um yeah i mean like that's really cool to hear and i yeah i'm, I'm stoked that that inspired you to get out there and that's i mean making these films um you know Vishka and i what we love to do is you know make these films inspire people to do that and, and live out these these you know have these dreams similar to what we have um and make them relatable too and I guess, you know, like that obviously wasn't the reason why we made the film and, and, you know, using those words at the end, because I was, this was such a personal transformation for me. And um, yeah, just learning, you know, just trying to basically share my honest and true experiences, I guess what I was trying to do with, you know, with the film and, and have, yeah, to hear that, hear that is really cool. I mean, sailing's like, I'm stumbling for words now, but it's something hard to describe. And it's something that, you know, everyone should <laughs> make a crossing on an ocean, spend time out there with themselves, be responsible for absolutely everything in that world, in their own world. Um, having that experience is, yeah, quite profound. Um, yeah. Well, it, you know, in the way that we wouldn't be able to sum up what surfing is like and what it provides for us to somebody who doesn't surf. I had never sailed. And so I could only intellectualize, you know, the lessons that you would learn from it. But I feel like you, again, put it into words in a way that made me kind of gave me a peek behind the curtain of all of the virtues that are inherent from being responsible for everything and kind of everything that you just said it really opened, opened it up. And I was like, Oh man, I get it. I want to go through a similar passage, you know? So. Yeah. And that's, um, that was what it was for us too. I felt like, uh, before the trip, before sailing, I really wanted a challenge. We both, mm -hmm. I and I both wanted a challenge. We knew it wasn't going to be easy. It's, um, you know, we wanted to be challenged. We wanted um the struggle and and sailing is that you know nothing not everything goes to plan you know it is um you have to work for it and it, it you learn a lot about yourself um and the people you know you're with on the boat um yeah it's you know it takes you it makes you vulnerable um it and it grows you as a person um i, I found that anyway i mean yeah yeah, and it felt like lessons that you just simply wouldn't learn any other way, you know? Totally, yeah. And you wouldn't, you don't really choose to. You don't wish, you don't want to be in that situation, but there's no way out. Like, and you, you have to kind of <laughs> learn to process it, learn to accept it, you know, and take something positive from it. Um, and yeah. Well, it's epic. Congrats on another amazing film. Thank you. Cheers. Um, yeah, it feels, yeah, it's cool. You know, I just want to add like, you know, making these films and doing these tours and stuff is what we really love to do. Um, you know, doing, doing the films and everything on the big screen um, and, and taking them around is really important to Ishka and I. And, and with each of our films, we really like to be able to give back to the communities and places that we visit. And, um, you know, due to the nature of, having babies and you know like these last couple of weeks we haven't Ishka and I aren't going to be traveling to these screenings around the world um which is a bit of sweet but we we've partnered with um with surf aid who you know Indonesia being the backdrop of this film um and the connection that we all have and and especially me personally with Indonesia 
Um, I'm really proud of all the work that Surfay do. Um, they you know, like all their educational, you know, educational programs, they, you know, implement, uh, you know, food security, clean water, women and health is a massive one. It, you know, women and health and medical, uh, women and babies, um, you know, the medical treatments and um, just all their groundwork, the agricultural work, you know, it really felt, you know, like a, um, like the right people to partner with on this film. So we, we've we decided that from all the proceeds of the ticket sales around the world, um, that we're donating that to SurfAid, which is, um, which is just great. You know, I'm really, really stoked to be giving back to them. So the absolute least we can do. They're an amazing organization. So they do things really, really well. So I think that's a great, great partner too. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Really cool. Well, how old is Ishka's kid, her baby? So they had a little baby boy and he was born exactly one week on the night after Naya. So two, one and a half weeks. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> really, really fresh. Man, amazing. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's cool. I mean, yeah, super cool. Yeah. Enjoy it. Enjoy the journey together. It's super cool that you guys are so, I mean, to be able to go through something like that with your close friends. So, yeah, 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 it is. It's the best that, um, yeah, I mean, we're planning, Anna and I are planning to come out in February, um, over okay. the States, I think. So it'd be cool to link up. Um, yeah. yeah you, guys, you guys are touring the film when you come, right? We got another little film in the works. Um, Basically, Kelly has been working on a little side project from his time on the boat. And I mean, there's so much footage, so much, so much footage that we haven't used in the film. A lot of, you know, really good surf sections and, and bits and pieces. And, and Kelly's telling a little bit more of a story about the board development and the relationship between Simon and I. It's a little offshoot um, of the Calypti film. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, 30, 40 minutes. And I think we're going to do a little film tour of that in February oh. over there. Okay, uh, perfect. Yeah, which will be fun. And yeah, good good opportunity to catch up. Yeah, for sure. I'll definitely, I'll be here in February. So I'll definitely link up with you guys. Cool. Right on, man. Thank you so much. And again, can't send enough well wishes and congratulations and all that sort of stuff. So enjoy. You're a legend. All right. Thanks, Matt. All right. Good thank show. you. See ya. All right, see ya.